Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. Welcome back to another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. I think you guys are going to love this episode today. I'm personally really excited. Uh, But first, let's get all of the uh, housekeeping stuff out of the way. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We do this a lot. It's a fun time. If you want to become part of the Event Icons family, make sure that you subscribe at www.event-icons.com where you can see all of our past episodes. You'll see all the blog posts that we post about each episode and you can just become in the know of everything going on. So Highly, highly recommend that. Um, Also, if you want to know everything that's going on within the greater events community, make sure that you subscribe to Endless's uh, weekly sound check is what we call ourselves, our weekly newsletter. So you can do so by going to uh, helloendless.com slash subscribe. Definitely go there. Um, That will really get you in all of the know of everything going on within the events community. But today I'm very excited to introduce you all to Steve. He is a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, and is the founder and CEO of Shindig, a patented new video chat technology that enables large-scale interactive events. With Shindig, Gutlib aims to redefine the state of the art online engagement in a multitude of verticals, from online promotional events, conferences, nightclubs, business meetings, games, and distance learning. If that is not enough, he also has an extensive music background where he has a label that discovered artists such as Nine Inch Nails, Jaw Rule, Lil Jon, and Pitbull, just to name a few. In case you've heard of those really popular people, it's really exciting stuff. But without any further ado, I would like to uh, introduce to the event icon Steve, Steve Gottlieb. Hey, it's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Presented by Endless Events, the show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Just follow us on social media to ask questions. Our iconic guests will answer them live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better the conversation. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Just tell your friends to watch live on any of our social media channels. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. Hi, or hi, Steve. How's it going? Hi, Sarah. So good to speak with you today. Your name, I swear, I like said it three times in practice before this, but it's still, there's so many, so many uh, syllables going on there. So I hope I didn't butcher it too bad. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, what we like to start off with everyone that's a guest on Event Icons is just really getting to know about you, getting to know more about your background. So how did you get from the music industry to now this full on events uh, industry? Well, it's interesting. Um, What made uh, TVT special as a record label was that we really took projects that were way out of the mainstream and and made the mainstream. Uh, my first record was a record called Television's Greatest Hits of old TV themes, which uh, we turned into a worldwide hit. Um, and then we went on to break artists like Nine Inch Nails, Pitbull, Ja Rule, and, as you mentioned, and, and had some 20 uh, platinum albums and, and uh, successes. Um, the real key to breaking an artist, especially the way we did it, you know, competing with the major labels, all the major labels controlled top 40 radio and what have you. TVT was all about building passionate fan groups uh, and creating premium experiences and super fans and evangelical uh, audiences that would then spread the word. And that was the common denominator, be it TV themes or, or pitbull recordings. <laughs> um, and so when I sold TBT and looked at the video conferencing world, um, I saw a complete lack of engagement. Uh, back when we started, everyone had their cameras turned off. Um, and I spoke to the heads of the big companies at the time. And they said, oh, well, the big secret is we're just offering 80 style teleconferencing because uh, no one has their cameras on. And that struck me as a problem in plain sight. Um, and the, the word, you know, teleconferencing that they were just offering the equivalent of teleconferencing 
really is revealing in the sense what I recognized was the architecture of most video conferencing is just that, teleconferencing. And who's been on a teleconference with 300 people and thought, gee, that's a great experience. If only we had pictures. <laughs> I mean, teleconferencing never worked for more than six, seven people anyway, for the same reason that video conferencing doesn't really work. Right. Um, and so it struck me that there was an opportunity to build something completely different, which is what we ended up building, but which in my mind, uh, to the extent people are using the other traditional platforms, they're struggling with the fact that most of those other platforms are built on the, on the architecture developed in the 1880s for the telephone, built on wires. And they're still based around a single conversation with the main feature being who has access to the mic. They don't allow what we expect in real life, which is that individuals have and prize their autonomy and their ability to kind of selectively engage with uh, a large group as they see fit. Uh, right. So and I like that you mentioned that since it's definitely like the whole topic and we'll get into a little bit later is, yeah, just this really building these experiences that kind of reflect more human like things because it, it's not normal. You don't just have 300 people in a room normally and expect everyone to get their ideas across and have this great effective communication where everyone's talking to each other and it's seamless. That just doesn't happen in normal and normal life. So I like that you've drawn from these experiences and noticed that, hey, something here is not working. Well, it does happen in real life. It is effective in real life. Um, I don't think it's happening effectively, you know, in it in the way it's uh, um, done online. And it's important for people to recognize why the problem's broken and how long it's been broken. Uh, when the webinar was introduced. The webinar is 25 years old this year. Uh, it was introduced the same year the Macarena was ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we were all talking on our Motorola StarTex in 1996. So when you use a webinar, whether it's branded Zoom webinar or Teams webinar or whatever webinar company you're using, or you use an architecture uh, that's effectively the same as a webinar, namely speakers and all the comments are text only, you're using a Motorola StarTech in an <laughs> age of, you know, iPhone 13. So uh, get a life. I mean, you know, <laughs> tech has moved on. So, yeah. Uh, the Nintendo 64 and the StarTech and and uh, and the webinar. Yeah. Um, uh, Fun fact, and, I was born in 1996, so uh, I am as old as the webinar. I've not known a world without webinars, I guess. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Well, um, a lot of great things happened in 1996. <laughs> I don't mean to pick on 1996. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, it, it's completely outdated. It's, it's interesting that, you know, from my entire lifespan, it seems like we haven't seen an evolution of the webinar. So definitely a problem there. <laughs> I'd say, um, uh, I agree with you. And um, <laughs> um, the, the reality was up until the pandemic, and I have to say how, you know, I don't think we, daily uh, empathize enough with the, you know, the 600,000 uh, uh, who lost their lives and their families and friends during this terrible episode. We all are so excited about moving on and um, uh, it's a heavy load that, that uh, a lot of people are bearing and, and I think they are do a lot of our, our sympathy and time. Um, right. and, um, and you're from you're in New York, right? So you saw a lot of this like head on. <laughs> really, I, you saw the horrors of it. Knock on wood, I, I don't think I personally had to deal with it uh, uh, a lot head on, though. Um, but I, I do stop and think and wonder with all the excitement about uh, us moving on that um, uh, we have not spent uh, enough time focused on on those who uh, can't move on quite as easily. Right. Um, that's I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. um, prior to the pandemic, people didn't know what a virtual event was. They really thought it was a, just a large video conference or or a webinar. Uh, the pandemic has changed that. Now, virtual events are projected to be an 800 billion with a B 
uh, sector uh, within uh, uh, less than 10 years. Wow. Uh, so as this new category comes into existence, uh, defining, you know, defining what that category is, uh, defining our expectations around that and clarifying uh, what it means to have a virtual event. Those are things that we're in the process of doing. And one of my pet peeves right now is uh, the misnomer of what networking is. Yes, let's get into the rant. Okay. <laughs> I'm ready to hear it. Just for everyone, right before this call, Steve was like, I have a rant for you all. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of hearing networking used in this way. So I'm, yeah, let's get into it. So um, networking is not, uh, forgive me, schedule. Uh, Someone's trying I'm, to network you, wouldn't network with you right now. <laughs> networking is definitively not scheduled one-on-one -on -one appointments. One has the opportunity to schedule one-on-one -on -one appointments 365 days a year. The reason why we go to physical events is to meet with the very people who won't schedule appointments with us. Uh, while going to physical events may involve pre-setting up uh, uh, advantageous meetings with people who you previously have relationships with, the real payoff is meeting the people you didn't plan on meeting, mm -hmm. meeting people opportunistically, being introduced to people by other people, having a chance to collaborate with other people. It is not the pre-planned one-on-ones. Networking is the opposite of pre-planned one-on-ones. And forgive me. And, and <laughs> so uh, these people who think that pre-planned one-on-ones is what networking is, I think have it all wrong and are doing people a disservice when they say, oh, we have networking because you could set up an appointment. Uh, uh, um, networking is about working a room. It is about being introduced by a mutual friend to someone they think you'll find interesting. It is about a host creating an ambience where people lower their guard and are suddenly open to solicitation in a way they weren't before. They're open to hearing new ideas in a way they might not have been before. They're open to a new introduction and a chance encounter that they wouldn't be open to otherwise. That's what networking is. It is not, it is letting your guard down. It is spontaneous. It is serendipitous. It is everything that is the opposite of a scheduled one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> it is also not speed dating. Imagine if tomorrow you learn Tinder has a great new app. Sweep, swipe left, swipe right, you're still gonna have to talk to the person, no matter which way you swipe. That's <laughs> what some of these platforms on offer in speed dating. Uh, you know, you're gonna just have to be stuck talking to someone and deal with their resentment for having their time wasted in talking to someone when they wanted to talk to somebody different. Um, <laughs> that's not networking either. That's so true. Um, networking is a, a, a part of what we, enjoy in events and what we take it for granted in real life freedom most of all the freedom to exercise some degree of autonomy over where we direct our attention um and um these platforms that take away your freedom i think are for the birds I like that. And uh, to offer another kind of analogy, I like what you said too. I never even really thought about this of the referral kind of thing of when you have your friend and you're like, oh, I've been talking to this person all day at this conference and I want you to meet them. There's so much to that that is so different than, you know, an AI finding out two commonalities between two people. You kind of have, it's like the same thing with online dating versus in-person dating. If we're going to get into this dating right. analogy, um, you know, you can, you can see a picture and you you can see the list of characteristics that that person has via an online profile, but meeting someone, you know, through a mutual friend has so many different connotations and it may sound different or it may sound very similar, 
but I feel like inherently they're different, you know, getting that referral, you have like someone to kind of vet that person. You have someone that's, you know, if you pop into someone's mind while you're mid conversation with someone else, that is a strong tie that you know that you probably will also have common interests with this person. So there's so many little things like that too, that you just don't even think about the simplicity of meeting someone. You know, our, our brains are so powerful that they're making all of these connections every day. And so it's things that happen on our subconscious level that we don't even think about introducing someone to another person. But it really is. There's a lot going on there. It's there pretty is, fascinating. Events are super rich and dynamic. And I point out a second thing. It's, it's, it's much more a salesperson or a business person has the relationship with their client going on all the time. What happens at events is that they get to say, hey, let me introduce you to my regional manager. Hey, let me introduce you to the product guy. He's going to be interested in your feedback. Hey, let me introduce you to my boss. He's, he's, he loves you guys. He thinks you're our best client. And, and it's all that collective experience. It's, oh, great. By the way, I came to this conference with my associate and my team member and this person from another division who was interested in using you or finding out more. So on both sides of the equation, it's, you know, what happens is events is rarely just a one-on-one. -on -one. Right. So-and-so's tagging along to give the meeting more gravitas. So-and-so's coming along because I'm moving on in responsibility and I'm transitioning to him and I want you to transition to him. It's a lot of rich, things. And if we're going to embrace virtual events, we shouldn't do it with a compromise. We should do it with, let's lean into this. In this new world, they're going to be the Teslas and they're going to be the Toyotas. They're <laughs> going to be the companies who say, hey, the pandemic taught us what is possible online. We can achieve miracles online. We can connect people at a fraction of the cost and have 10 times the payoff online um, or a hundred times the payoff. If we, and, and there are going to be people who lean into that new future. And there are people who say, no, I like 2019 better. Absolutely. We are seeing that already. I feel like that divide is becoming, you know, more and more expansive every day. These people that are terrified of, yeah, taking those risks, those people that, you know, just desperately want to go back to the way things were. But I just love, I want to reiterate what you said, just we can make miracles online. And I feel like that is so true and something that we all really need to kind of take into heart with this next future of the year. Um, but I, I do want to ask how. So, you know, we're talking about these replicas replicating these, you know, in-person experiences. Um, I think a lot of event planners would be interested to know, you know, how the, the getting it there. I think everyone kind of buys into the why, obviously you want to have more genuine, authentic, exciting interactions with people, but how do event, how can event planners do that? Well, they have to think about what makes their in-person event work. Um, uh, nobody throwing an in-person event would say, you know what we should do? Let's save our speakers the travel. Let's just record their speech and we'll throw the recording up on the stage. Because <laughs> um, that way we'll get more, more people who couldn't come. No, having the person there is important. Why, is he gonna give a better speech because he's there? No, because it signifies he's gonna be accessible to us. You're going to have the chance to talk to him privately and pass a business card. You might, there's going to be naturally going to be a Q and a session where you're going to be able to be face to face. You're going to be, take the mic uh, in the audience. They're going to pass it to you. You're going to say, Hey, I'm so-and-so from so-and-so. And you're going to get name checked in front of that high value person. And you're going to introduce your company and say, and maybe he'll remember you. And maybe then he'll take your email uh, the next time. Um, so that notion of the speakers aren't going to be on recording, they're actually going to be at the physical event, is all about the implication that your attendees are going to have the opportunity to interact with one another. So you're dreaming that, you know, if you're South by Southwest, we'll just throw this up on swap card, or we're CES, we'll throw this up on Teams, and we'll get, you know, a press-worthy, world-shattering event. It's not going to happen. Um, events depend on them being 
live and spontaneous and relevant. Being live means the speaker is going to have to answer questions that are relevant to the audience in the moment and respond spontaneously and maybe make news and maybe uh, be candid in a way that they wouldn't be in a pre-record that might get edited out. And likewise, you're going to have a chance to interact in the audience. And so Shindig is really fundamentally about a profoundly different level of interpersonal interactivity amongst participants and with the stage. So I don't want to, you know, people should go to the shindig.com website and see see what we do that's so different. Uh, but in short, any one of thousands can be brought to the stage. There's no second class citizenship where people enter their questions in text and and are just good listeners. And likewise, anyone in the event can talk to anyone else in the event. It's just a click of a of a mouse or on their on, on their phone. So it's super fluid. Uh, there aren't multi-step clunky breakout rooms and whatnot. It's you are free to talk to whom you want, when you want. And when there's a presentation, the presenter is free to open the stage up for questions or or have a backstage to pre-screen uh, prospective questioners as they see fit. So, uh, Oh, I like that. And with people using this type of technology, are there any examples that you've seen that makes you really excited where you're like, wow, that was the perfect definition of a spontaneous experience that wouldn't have been able to happen elsewhere? Have you seen it? Do you have any moments like that that come to mind? You know, uh, I, in this, I share um, with everyone in the in your audience. There's nothing like being in the event business. There's nothing like connecting people and helping people make meaningful connection. Uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of physical event you're throwing, uh, whether it's a party uh, or, uh, uh, um, you know, a sophisticated, uh, you know, high flutant, uh, uh, only the uh, only medical specialists or, <laughs> or physicists will understand the content of. Uh, it doesn't matter who you're connected. Uh, it is richly rewarding. Um, things we've done that I found most exciting. Hey, we did an author event from the author of Origami Yoda, where we had, I think, 600 eight-year-olds on showing off their origami <laughs> puppets, uh, teaching their mothers how to uh, operate their, their cameras and getting online. <laughs> and that was great. And we've done, uh, we did a, uh, a reunion for Swarthmore, where everyone uh, it was for the class of, I think, 1947. Everyone in the <laughs> office, uh, audience, uh, everyone in, in attendance were in their 90s. And the alumni head who organized it was in their 90s. Nice. So from eight-year-olds to 90-year-olds, um, recently we did, we're, we're working with Global Citizen on a number of amazing uh, uh, Global Citizen events. We did a John Legend event with them uh, backstage for his TV broadcast. That was amazing. We did a... Uh, a Biden inaugural celebration for a human rights campaign, uh, which was great. We recently did the Harvard Law School's uh, reunions, watching all the reunion classes get together. We also did a bunch of graduation events. Um, um, we've done, you know, galas and parties and fundraisers. And we recent and, uh, you know, five day conferences with thousands of different subsessions. Uh, wow. and everything in between. You know, our uh, um, we had uh, Michael J. Fox do a big event for Gartner with a QA and a that was pretty cool. And, uh, you so know. with some of these things like uh, like virtual graduations that you've done, um, what are, have you seen like any of those? So people, anyone that's in the attend, in, as an attendee can go talk to other attendees as well as, you know, faculty and things like that. So it's just open across the board to those spontaneous interactions. Is that kind of how it works? So the graduations enabled the provost to have a moment on camera on stage in front of the entire audience to acknowledge each graduate individually, not a picture or a slide, but a live moment of congratulations. Wow, that's and, huge. And the family was in the audience able to all be private chatting with one another. Oh, so you had all the friends, faculty, and family private chatting in small groups while they were watching the presentation on the stage with what was on the stage also being simul streamed to, you know, uh, 
on, on social media. So unlimited viewers also seeing it. I so love that. that. Engagement is kind of what we enable this very sophisticated stage, which allows you to a lot of production on what happens on stage, the audience able to gather privately as appropriate and the ability to simul stream. And, and uh, that's just one of the kind of yeah. uh, uh, robust kind of case studies that uh, we, we would do. Oh, I love how you're rethinking that because I have to tell you, that was probably one of the saddest moments. Well, it was still great celebrating my friends, but I had a, a, a friends in a couple classes younger than me that had graduated in the in the height of the pandemic. And it, that's exactly what you described. That is a single slide. Their name got robotically read and that was about it. And it just, oh, it made me feel so bad because I thought back to my graduation and there really was that sense of collectiveness and my parents were up in the in the crowd you know crying and just being so proud and you know whispering to each other so I love that those little moments that are so special to the human experience be kind of replicated you don't necessarily have to all be together in person for those you know things that make it all worthwhile and just so much more exciting to still be able to happen so i love that you kind of rethought it in that way to to account for those types of interactions well, what it really helps us see is a future because there'll always be the in-person graduations for the residential colleges and graduate schools but as education sees that it is economically uh, one way of freeing future students of debt is moving more and more of education online. But what the challenge will be then is classrooms of uh, 10 or 20 may work fine on a Zoom room or uh, may work fine with asynchronous uh, components. But at some point, students need to have a sense of a campus, a sense of campus-wide experiences, a study hall, places Completely. where they can meet, make connections and whatnot. And what we can enable is that whole robust, you know, institutional experience as well as a better classroom. Oh, I think that's so true. Yeah, that's what I've always thought about online education. But I love that you, you're you mentioning that too. And just a word of advice too to, to event planners that are maybe still wanting to just go back to how things were. Other industries are not. Like you said, education is progressing more online. And any other industry, every place, you know, work the workplace is now getting more, you know, is going to be living online. So it's just, it's a matter of time for us to follow, for us to be ahead of that and help facilitate better engaging experiences. Because if we try to go back to the way things were, I think the event industry would be left behind because that's not <laughs> the direction that the rest of the world is going in. So I, I'm really glad you touched on that as well. I think the model that should inform event planners is to think about what happened when the book and the magazine and the newspaper got dethroned as the embodiments of text. When we got rid of the physical as the embodiment of text, all of a sudden you had everything from Twitter to Wikipedia. <laughs> and the value by which we judge text was much less about who was the publisher than its relevance and timeliness. Relevance and timeliness are gonna assert themselves as the key values in events. It's not gonna be about let's wait until the annual event, it's scheduled six months from now. <laughs> it's gonna be who can collect the right people at the right time who need to share with one another, with sponsors who need to reach them, with people desperate to talk to one another about this pressing issue next week. And the people who can be opportunistic and see that new paradigm, that it's not, a, that the, the architecture of physical events was, became very much about let's pile on interest group with interest group with interest group and interest group. So we have huge scale because it's easier to sell that scale. Now it's gonna be, let's get the interest group. Let's get the people who are intense about this. And let's now scale it by virtue of being able to reach people anywhere in the world. And let's be opportunistic about when and why people need to gather and make that happen. And so this is a big opportunity for event planners. They're not going anywhere as long as they recognize the challenges on them to rethink 
what their client's agenda is and how they can achieve that now in a world that recognizes events could go, grow exponentially. Physical events were always limited. Okay, we're going to add a marketplace. We're going to add, you know, this, you know, very small incremental growth. Now you're talking about sky's the limit if you have <laughs> ideas about how to organize people and you have that ability and you work out the programmatics of how to make online events exciting. Oh, I love that. I have to say too, I feel like you are the master of analogies. We've gone from online dating, speed dating to uh, now the transfer from, from text and paper, newspaper to online. I think it's true. And I, I love everything that you've said. Um, just to wrap it up, what is one last tip that you would leave to event planners that are still kind of struggling to navigate the future of events um, or are just looking to the rest of 2021 and, you know, or could use some guidance? What's one last parting uh, wisdom you would give to them? Well, um, I would think about what makes something live. Uh, you know, uh, Google, Google had a product called Google Hangouts. It failed. Facebook came out with Facebook Live. They paid people a ton of money to do content for it. You know, it's kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, no longer really uh, a content provider in the same way. To be live, things have to be participatory and interactive. Um, and, you know, that is the essence of why we attend live events, and that's what makes them compelling that they're a little bit unpredictable, that there is that unpredictable element, that serendipity, that uh, individual, it's, it's live because your presence actually makes a difference. You're an active participant, not a viewer, not a watcher, not a lurker. And the more you embrace active participation, the more vibrant, uh, the more more of mouth, the more important your events uh, will be uh, and the more they'll generate follow-on events. There's a real risk in people who are just purveying recordings and stale kind of asymmetrical experiences online that they will kill the potential golden goose of uh, that virtual represent, uh, virtual events represents to them. Wow, I think that is such a great point, such a great thing to sum up our entire episode today. Steve, thank you so much for joining me. This really, I think, is going to be one of my favorite episodes and just something really great to share with everyone. Um, so yes, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you too for everyone who watched. Um, you know where to find us. And also, Steve, where can people find you if they want to connect with you and learn a little bit more about what you do? I'm Steve at Shindig.com and readily available to talk to anyone who uh, I love event people. And uh, <laughs> I think you guys are great. And your creativity is uh, in, uh, in uh, great uh, short supply these days. So uh, I'm available there. And come to shindig.com, sign up for a demo. Uh, we have a bunch of new features that we're about to announce that are really game changers, including something called the virtual lobby. And uh, um, uh, I hope uh, to see you guys around. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you again to everyone who watched and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch all of the bonus content, resources mentioned, and an invite to our Facebook and LinkedIn groups, head to www.event-icons.com. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode, share your biggest takeaway, and just tag your social media posts with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again soon, right here on hashtag event icons.